Okay, others, we should start. Hmm. Swami so, has joined. <clears throat> okay, sir. Good evening to one and all. I'm Adarshwasa, and with utmost gladness and peace, yes. I would like to. I would like to invite you all to a fulfilling and relaxing evening with His Holiness Swami Mukundananda. I welcome you to your one-stop solution towards sustainable, stress-free life. Yes, easy to comprehend and easy to integrate actions into your life to yield the results of a happy, fulfilling and peaceful life that you've always wished for. National Institute of Technology, Raul Kela has been one of the pioneer institutes of India in imparting high quality technical education to produce high quality engineers who have been contributing to various fields of nation building. Now for becoming highly competent human beings, we are introducing value education that aims at replacing stress in life with happiness. With the rise of globalization and consumerism culture, most people are suffering from stress. The spirituality has lost its role in contemporary life. No doubt, everyone wants peace in their life. But the mechanism to get peace is really a massive predicament. We are also proud to state that value education has been incorporated into the elementary and high school curriculum as well. The National Education Policy, NEP 2020, provides to include in the curriculum ethical reasoning, traditional Indian values, and all basic human and constitutional values. It also provides that the curriculum and pedagogy from the foundational stage onwards to be redesigned to be strongly rooted in the Indian and local context and ethos in terms of cultures, traditions, heritage, customs, language, philosophy, and so on, in order to ensure that education is maximally relatable, relevant, interesting, and effective for our students. In this effort, a step is being taken by NIT Raulkela to develop a scientific strategy to adopt the peace in life. This rational and concise approach is unique. It includes the scientific knowledge on how to live happily, peacefully, and stress-free in whatever profession or social strata one belongs to. The knowledge covers five aspects of life, body, mind, relations with friends and family, money, and God. With this true scientific reasoning, one can live with wisdom without subscribing to blind beliefs and unscientific religious practices and not fall prey to the so-called gurus and fake babas. As students and academic professionals, we hope this seminar would benefit you and bring you closer to the peace we all wish to pursue. Thank you. Now, I would like to invite our esteemed Dean of Student Affairs, Professor Siddharth S. Jenna, to begin this event with a few words. Professor Jenna, please. Sir, we are unable to hear you, sir. Sir, we are not able to hear you, sir. No, sir, uh, we are not able to hear you. Maybe some problem with the mic. No, sir, it is not working. Uh, can you, can, uh, can your uh, camera has mic? So you please remove your, this microphone. And... No, sir, it is not working. We cannot hear you. You can uh, remove, remove once and again uh, put it uh, into the.
okay but we are supposed to do we should uh, <clears throat> go for next uh, level uh, in others you please uh, yes sir. go ahead without waiting maybe sir has some problem okay okay sir uh, we are extremely sorry for the technical issues uh, that we faced right now uh, we have now arrived to the most important time of this evening it is with great pleasure and happiness that i would like to welcome his holiness swami mukundananda who is here with us today before he graces us with his wisdom i would request dear professor gyanaranjan senapati professor in charge value education nit raulkila to introduce his holiness to everyone present here thank you लाइट मोर फिकर के ओके सो वेर एक्सट्रीमली सॉरी फॉर द इनकन्वीनियंस कॉस्ट सो लेट मी इंट्रोड्यूस हिज होलीनेस स्वामी मुकुंदानंद सो नो इंट्रोडक्शन इज नीडेड एक्चुअली स्वामी सो एज अ फॉर्मलिटी लेट मी इंट्रोड्यूस स्वामी मुकुंदानंद इज अ बेस्ट सेलिंग ऑथर an authority on mind management a teacher of yoga and holistic health for thousands of seekers across the globe a guiding light to illumine the esoteric aspects of meditation swami ji needs no introduction as a world renowned teacher of spirituality a senior disciple of jagat guru shri krupalu ji maharaj and an alumnus of iit delhi and iim kolkata swami ji has been in service to the society by preaching for over four decades in an age where spirituality <clears throat> in an age where spiritual awakening and knowledge has found outmost relevance in modern lives swami ji has founded jk yog a charitable and volunteer driven organization which works towards comprehensive development of the society by addressing the physical emotional intellectual and spiritual dimensions of human personality swami ji himself works tirelessly to conduct life transformational programs to address the problem that plague the minds of today's adults and youths he reveals the secrets of both indian and western scriptures with rigorous scientific logic logic applicable in modern context his illust illustrations through humorous stories and real life examples stay with you long after you listen in this way he not only addresses all modern day problems that plague the minds of many but also inspires people to practically incorporate timeless timeless divine wisdom into their daily lives many have found solace as they read and related with his best selling books namely seven mindsets for success happiness and fulfillment the science of mind management and seven divine laws to awaken your best self all featured in number 1 in amazon's movers and shakers a multitude of other literary compositions by swami ji include commentary on bhagavad gita 
books on yoga, healthy diet, and many other books for youths and children. Extremely popular on various social media channels as well. His lectures on YouTube have been watched over a hundred and fifty million times as they shed light on a plethora of questions that confound the minds of the young and experienced. Swamiji's logical lectures and practical advice marks this prominence, even at, marks his prominence even at Fortune 500 companies in the USA, such as Google, Intel, Verizon, and Oracle, at various NGOs and non-profit organizations, such as United Nations, DRDO, Indian Railways, and at the top tier universities, such as IITs, IIMs, NITs, MIT, Northwestern, Princeton, Stanford, and Yale. Over and above the preaching activity, Swamiji also heads a charitable medical hospital, naturopathy care and yoga center, university education and vocational training in Odisha. Thank you. We welcome you, Swamiji, for this uh, <coughs> program, for this event, for your wonderful talk. We are waiting. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Gyanaranjan Senapati, for uh, enlightening us about his grace. We are very pleased and uh, honored to have him in our presence. Now, before I invite him to share with us, I would like to invite Mr. Kulamani Patra from the Civil Engineering Department to sing for us a welcome song. Thank you, Mr. Kulamani Patra. I would like to invite Mr. Kulamani Patra from the Civil Engineering Department to sing for us a welcome song. Thank you. Swami Ji, Radhe Radhe. Radhe Radhe. Ah, Swami Ji, my voice. Are you listening to me? Gyanu, Gyanu, Abu, my voice. Are you listening to me? Yes, sir. Radhe Radhe, you please go ahead. Radhe Radhe, Swami Ji. Are you listening to me? Yes, sir. Today, Swami Ji, ghar aaye. आज सखे स्वामी जी घर आए हमारे मन आनंद भयो रे आज सखे स्वामी जी घर आए दर्शन से सब पाप बिना से दुख दरिद्र सब दूर गयो रे दर्शन से सब पाप बिना से दुख दरिद्र सब दूर गयो रे अमृत बचन सुनत तम नासो अमृत बचन सुनत तम नासो घट भीतर प्रभु पाय गयो रे आज सखे स्वामी जी घर आए आज सखे स्वामी जी घर आए जन्म जन्म के संशय टूटे भव भय पाप मिटाय गयो रे जन्म जन्म के संशय टूटे भव भय पाप मिटाय गयो रे ब्रह्मानंद दास दासन को ब्रह्मानंद दास दासन को चरण कमल लिपिटाय रयो रे आज सखे स्वामी जी घर आए आज सखे स्वामी जी घर आए हमारे मन आनंद भयो रे आज सखे स्वामी जी घर आए आज सखे स्वामी जी घर आए आज सखे स्वामी जी घर आए स्वामी जी आपका जय हो 
Swami ji ki jai ho, aaj sakhe Swami ji ghar aaye. Thank you for this beautiful song, Mr. Kulamani Patra. Welcome, Swami ji. Thank you, Your Holiness, for being with us today and for giving us your... Need to unmute yourself. Ah, sorry, sir. Thank you, Your Holiness, for being with us today and for giving us your valuable time to speak with us. I would like to request all the participants to reserve their questions to the end of this talk. Please feel free to use the raise hand option, the raise hand option during the meeting so that we can take note of your questions and give you a turn during the question answer session that will be following this talk. Now, I would like to humbly invite His Holiness to take over the meeting and share his wisdom with us all. His Holiness, Swami Mukundananda. Namaste. My heartfelt gratitude to all the members of the faculty, staff, and the students of the wonderful NIT Raurkela for giving me the opportunity to connect with all of you via this online platform. And thank you for the rousing and heartwarming welcome. I do have a program subsequent to this, so there will be a hard limit for this program at 6.45 inclusive of the Q&A. Let's try and fit as much as we can into this. The topic today is reprogramming the software of your mind. The biggest inner resource we have is our mind. It is the most powerful tool at our disposal for transforming our life. It creates about 60,000 thoughts a day. And these thought potentials, if they can be harnessed, they can lead our life on the path of happiness, fulfillment, success, and auspiciousness. The simple causation is, that a pure mind leads to noble and sublime thoughts which result in good actions. And an impure mind leads to obnoxious, puny thoughts which result in terrible actions. So if we wish to improve our actions and circumstances in our life, we have to start by improving our thoughts and that requires changing the state of our mind. Most of you today are engineering students who after graduation will move into corporate careers to become leaders of society. I would like to share with you a study uh, published in the Harvard Business Review on the performance of leaders with their state of mind. One person, say for example, Ramesh, he is a senior vice manager in a company. <clears throat> he woke up in the morning and he realized it is late. He rushed to the restroom that agitated him. And while eating his breakfast, he got into a little quarrel with his wife and then rushed into the vehicle. When he got onto the road, he got stuck in a traffic jam. And that has put him in a mood of frustration, agitation and disappointment. Another manager, he is uh, the marketing vice president of a company. He got up a little early at six o'clock 
He went out, took some deep breaths, did pranayam, took a morning walk in the fresh air. And then uh, before going to office, he helped his son and daughter in their homework and then came by the metro train to his office, calm, relaxed. Now, which of these two do you think will perform better in their job? Scientists did a study over 30 countries of 750 organizations, and they identified 18 states, mental states of leaders, starting from the worst, depressed, a little better, dejected, a little better, frustrated, a little better, all the way to euphoric and ecstatic. Now they found that the extreme states are uncommon in leaders, ecstatic or depressed. But in between, usually leaders find themselves. So either they could be calm, happy, and equipoised. This is C-H-E. Or they could be frustrated, anxious, tired, stressed, fats. Now, they discovered that leaders who are operating at CHE against FATS, their effectivity in their work is 100% more than the leaders who are in the state of frustration, anxiety, tiredness, and stress. The conclusion was, that to be effective in your profession, you need to know how to control your mind. Now, you are learning technology at NIT, but that is technology related to the external world. Connected with the laws of physics, chemistry, etc., mathematics, and then is the internal world the mind, the intellect, the ego. What is the technology related to that? This was described in the ancient books of wisdom because our Indian culture <laughs> nurtured the spirit of inner investigation. And many seers, they transformed their own mind into a personal laboratory and they probed into the esoteric secrets of how this mind and intellect work, why they become impure, how they can get purified, and what are the tools and techniques for this. So they discovered a tremendous connection between the thoughts we generate and the experiences in life. Now, we all know that happiness is a consequence of the thoughts we keep. One person is sitting calmly. You go and say something to him that creates an unhappy thought. He becomes miserable. And then somebody else goes and says something that creates a happy thought. There's a smile on his face. In both cases, Happiness and misery was a consequence of thoughts. Well, actually, these thoughts, they work as sculptors. They chisel our appearance. And that is why you look at somebody and you say, Kuch dal mein kala is par bilkul vishwas mat karna dhokhebaaz lagta. And you look at somebody else and say, Are he seems to be so happy. How do you know that he is happy? The happy thoughts within manifested on the external countenance. In fact, the Vedas go to the extent of telling us that the circumstances in your life are also drawn by your thoughts. Let us say, for example, 
somebody finds that his neighbor is very irritating in behavior. So Ramdath has got a neighbor called Vishnudath, and he finds Vishnudath is always creating irritation. He says, My God, I'm all disturbed. He goes to stay in another neighborhood. There he gets a neighbor called Shivdat, who also keeps disturbing him. Now he keeps on changing his neighborhoods and finds disturbing people until he realizes that it's better to grow in my own tolerance. And when he learns to master his anger and frustration from within, he finds that good neighbors have started coming to live with him. What does this mean? That circumstances in our life come for a purpose. The whole universe is designed for our gradual purification. And if the universe decides at this time, the lesson you need to learn is to control your irritability and frustration. It gives us circumstances that expose our weakness. And we are forced to grapple with that weakness and eliminate it. So if we focus on developing pure thoughts, we will find wonderful opportunities coming our way. This is the importance of the mind. Now, some people are really expert in handling the mind. And mostly, people have not learned this art. Sundar Pichai's story is famous on the internet as the cockroach theory. I don't need to introduce Sundar Pichai to engineering students. All of India is proud of his accomplishments, the legendary CEO of Google. He was sitting by himself in a restaurant and on the table in front of him, there were about eight elderly ladies and gentlemen sitting, having their dinner and chatting. When a cockroach happened to flow, fly in through the open door of the restaurant, and came to rest on the blouse of one old lady. That lady was terrified looking at its whiskers. Now, maybe for Indians, it is not such a disturbing sight. We have gotten used to it. But this was America. The lady got up and screamed in the hope that the cockroach would somehow go away or somebody would take it away. And that disturbed the cockroach. It took flight. And this time it decided to land on the forehead of another elderly gentleman. It was his turn to stand up and scream. And that startled the cockroach again and took flight one more time and came and to rest on the back of the neck of an, another old lady. Slowly, all of them were shouting and screaming. And Sundar Pichai was looking at this. Now the waiter entered to find out what was the commotion about. At that time, the cockroach took off once again and landed on the waiter's tie. The waiter, however, <coughs> did not react, but used the best possible response. He just froze to allow the cockroach to become comfortable, settle down and fold its legs. And when its posture was changed, he saw, he took the napkin from behind, grabbed the cockroach, and went and released it outside the restaurant door. Sundar Pichai was looking at this and he started wondering what was the cause of the disturbance of these old people? Was it the cockroach? If it was, it should have disturbed the waiter as well. Now, if the waiter did not get disturbed, 
it means that the cockroach was not the cause then what disturbed these old people and he understood he came to the conclusion the cockroach only created a difficult situation the waiter had the ability to handle it these old people had not learned the art of handling that stressful situation likewise life does create stressful situations you know during this present pandemic many huge corporations in orissa as well they've had special programs with me swami ji this situation is creating tremendous stress amongst all of us and the employees give us some wisdom on how to handle it so of course what i wish to say is that it's the nature of life not the pandemic one problem goes another arises the second goes the third arises as swami vivekanand said life is the continual unfoldment of a being under circumstances tending to press it downwards life presses us downwards this world the universe is the university of hard knocks we face them and we grow from within to become better people so what are then the tools to improve the states of our mind well the first tool to keep in mind is to look on challenges not as obstructions not as reasons to become dejected and depressed but to change your attitude towards them and see these problems as opportunities to grow as you know the saying goes that life presents you with a lemon now your option is whether to become bitter i got a lemon or to change it into a lemonade in which case it will work to your benefit likewise when you are faced with difficulties how do you respond remember there are always choices difficult situations will come but nobody can force you to be unhappy one husband he came back to his newly married wife and said aaj to mere jeevan ka sabse badhiya din hai the wife said what happened my dear husband she he said you know what our bmw it got into an accident a terrible accident and look this nail has gotten dislodged from my little finger the wife said my dear hubby you were so attached to you or bmw i know how much you loved it and it has gotten smashed and you saying it's the best day of my life so the husband said you know what this teenager hit me from behind i had stopped on the red light it was no fault of mine but he came and whacked me from behind the entire dicky collapsed but i am safe what is there about the car we'll get another one if anything had happened to me that may have become irreplaceable now look the situation was a negative one he had gotten an accident but he had the option how to look at it and he chose a positive stance in the same situation somebody would could have said ye bhagwan ne kya kar diya this is my unlucky day but the art to learn 
is how to utilize difficulties and convert them into steps for rising higher. Let me give you the example of the legendary Ratan Tata. Ratan Tata took over Tata Motors in 1990 when it was primarily a truck making company. And it was his dream to create an indigenously designed car within the budget of one lakh rupees. And that dream was realized when in 1998, Tata Motors produced the Indica car with a budget of 1,25,000 rupees, the cheapest car in the world. He thought it would be a grand success, but it was not. The sales were just not there. So they took a strong decision in 1999 to sell it off. Ford Motors in USA expressed interest and they invited the Tata board so Ratan Tata, along with his board of directors, flew to New York and then to Detroit. And they were sitting face to face with Bill Ford and his board of directors. Now, Bill Ford, probably as a negotiation strategy, tried to bully Ratan Tata. He insulted and humiliated him. He said, you knew nothing about the motor car business. Why did you get into it? We are doing you a favor by purchasing this product line. That evening, Ratan Tata was very quiet and thought about it. He did not go to the meeting the next day. He changed the tickets. He took his board members back to New York and back to India and made a decision that he would invest his time and energy into the motor car industry. And the consequence was it started growing bigger and bigger and became one of the important motor, uh, motor car manufacturers in the world. But now, by 2008, the clock had turned around. There was a great recession in the United States in that financial meltdown, Ford Motors got into trouble. And their two worst performing brands were Jaguar and Land Rover. So Tata's offered to purchase it. J-L-R. This time, Bill Ford and his board of directors came over for a meeting in Mumbai with Ratan Tata and company. Bill Ford said, we were in real trouble and you are doing us a favor by purchasing these two brands. Now, Ratan Tata could have again insulted Bill Ford the way he had done it. However, he said nothing. They purchased those two cars for $2.3 billion. That's a huge amount, about 14,000 crore rupees. And those Jaguar and Land Rover have become amongst the best selling cars in the world. So Ratan Tata showed the positive state of mind. If there is a line, somebody is humiliating you by drawing a big line, you don't need to erase his line. You just draw a bigger line by the side. Ratan Tata had learned the art of harboring positivity and proper mindsets within him. So what mindsets are available to us? We start off with the mindset of infinite potential. All of us have infinite potential potential for growth. Very often, we do not realize this. So our own beliefs limit us. You know, in Gajapati district in southern Orissa, 
close to Mahindragiri Parvat, there are some elephant trainers. I happened to be going by there from Parla Khimundi, and I saw these huge elephants were tied with a rope around their feet to a wooden peg dug into the ground. So I asked the Mahavat that how come this elephant can pull a tree out and how come it is tied by this rope with a little peg to the ground? He said, you know what Swamiji, when the elephant was little, we tied it up like this. And at that time, it did not have the ability to yank that peg out. And as it grew up, it became conditioned by the belief that if there's a rope around its leg, it can do nothing about it. So we people also condition ourselves by our beliefs. Three people tell you, you can amount to nothing in life. And we develop a belief, you know, I am a failure. But Henry Ford, the, he said that whether you believe you can do something or you believe you cannot, in either case, you are right. These beliefs are such an important part of our personality that if your belief tells you, I will fail, your own mind and intellect will sabotage your efforts to result in failure. And if your belief system says everything is possible by the grace of God, then you, your own mind will become your best friend. Let us take inspiration from the Mensa Society. So, of course, this is a one-way conversation online. Otherwise, I would have asked that, have you all heard of Mensa? I am sure you have. It is a society for the super intelligent. So only those are eligible to become members who have an IQ of more than 140, which means the upper 2%. And the 98% below that are not eligible. So this Mensa, in the year 1950, its membership had dwindled to four members. Today it has got 150,000 members. Then Viktor Serebriakov of Austria became the chairman of Mensa. And he remained the chairman till 1990. And he was the one who rejuvenated it. However, Viktor Serebriakov was not a genius. In fact, he was declared a dunce in his childhood. When he was 15 years old, his uh, teacher reached a wrong judgment and told Viktor that he was a fool and he would not amount to anything in his life. So Victor believed his teacher's evaluation of him and he dropped out from school. For the next 17 years, he only did menial work. And then at the age of 31 or 32, he applied to the army for recruitment and they took his IQ test. In that test, they discovered their scale of IQ stopped at 161 and he had crossed the scale. So they didn't know what his IQ was. That was the first time he realized he was a genius. Just that change transformed him completely. After that, he wrote books on the lumberjack business, woodcutting. He wrote books on IQ and he ruled that IQ industry for so long. What transformed was his belief. If you notice, the Bhagavad Gita uses the same formula. The listener Arjun is completely confused. The situation is so difficult. What will I do? And Lord Krishna, the first thing he does is to change his belief. He says, Arjun, you are not this body. 
made of pus blood stool urine and mucus if you think you are this body you will limit yourself and your potential you are the eternal soul nainam chindanti shastrani nainam dahati pavaka na chainam kledyantyapo na shoshayati matrushtah you are blessed with infinite potential and that one change in belief created such a huge difference now the second tool i would like to present to you is develop a growth mindset so what is a growth mindset some people believe that we are born with a set of talents and whatever you are born with you can't do anything beyond that so if you are a born singer you will be able to sing well if you are not a born singer there is nothing you can do much about it so it's a different mindset other students believe that no 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 we may be at the bottom of the rung but with hard work with proper knowledge and practice and guidance and mentorship we can keep on improving this is called the growth mindset researchers have seen that they have given mindset tests to students to see what kind of mindset do they possess and then divided them into fixed mindset versus growth mindset and they have discovered what a difference of attitude they have towards life those with the fixed mindset they don't want difficult problems because they fear failing they fear coming in touch with their weaknesses they don't want challenging tasks they'd rather do those tasks they are comfortable in while those with the growth mindset when they were asked by the teachers do you want an easy problem or a difficult problem they said give me a difficult problem they wanted to be challenged they wanted to know where they need to improve because they wanted to grow it was based on their belief that they can grow now let me give you the example of two friends who went to the hyderabad public school this is a middle level school in hyderabad one was sat and the other was ram now <clears throat> sat was an average student and ram was blessed with brilliant intellect so <clears throat> ram he cracked the jee and he landed up in iit madras premier institute sat did not crack the jee he did not even go get into any of the nits he went into the manipal institute of technology again a middle level engineering college not too bad but sat was very hard work he would keep on applying himself and striving hard while his friend uh, ram he had a lust for movies and for trash novels and for wasting his time in the canteen with his friends and bunking classes so because of that hard work that sat was doing the consequence was that slowly he started improving and finally when he graduated from engineering he got admission into uh, milwaukee in usa so he did his engine his post graduation from there and you meet him after 25 years he is the ceo of microsoft satya nadella and this ram his actual name is ramu mithyavardhanulu you have never heard of him why because he never amounted to anything 
He was born with so much of talent, but he squandered it all away. So life is not about the set of cards you were dealt. Life is about how you play with these cards and never uh, limit yourself by this mindset that I cannot change, I cannot improve. Harbor the growth mindset. Now, the next tool I'd like to share with you is the power of habits. And this is where a major part of the reprogramming of the mind happens. This brain of ours consists of 100 billion neurons. Now, that's not a small number. It means 10 to the power 11, 100 billion. So whenever we do any mental or physical work, it ignites the neurons in the sensory motor region, the neocortex, the prefrontal cortex, enabling us to do physical activities, to think, to analyze, to feel. However, this brain is such an amazing mechanism. When it realizes an activity is getting repeated, then it creates certain programs to mechanize that activity and make it easier for, for itself. And that is how you keep on growing with practice. So like, for example, the first time that we were typing, we had to exert our brain to the max to make the quick brown fox jump over the lazy dog. You know, the typing sentence that you do. We had to exert, where is the A, where is the B? And then slowly we got better at it and even better at it and even better at it. How did this happen? The brain in the basal ganglia kept on creating softwares, programs to mechanize those activities. So you just had to think A and the correct finger jumped to the key. And then later on, you just had to think of the word and the sequence got enacted by your fingers. And then finally, at the end of a year, you're typing at 60 to 80 words a minute. Now, if a villager comes and looks at you, you know, there is close to Raurkela, 20 kilometers away, there's a place called Biramitrapur. So let's say there is a villager from there who comes who has never seen a typewriter or a computer and he sees you doing like this. Says, My God, how is he typing so fast? Is he a yogi? Has he got some siddhi? <clears throat> it is not a siddhi. It is a consequence of one year's practice. So that is the reason that whenever we learn something new, we move from the first stage which is conscious incompetence. You're doing it consciously and yet you are incompetent. And then you keep practicing, practicing until you move to the stage of conscious competence. Now you are consciously applying and becoming expert at it. And you carry on practicing. And then you move to the stage of unconscious competence. Now, even while thinking of other things, you can type. <clears throat> even while speaking with others and listening to Radio Mirchi, you can drive the car. You've become now unconsciously competent. So this is the programming nature of the brain and this quality of the brain for neuroplasticity. <clears throat> it applies to our thoughts as well. If you re repeatedly bring worrisome thoughts, your brain will get programmed to generate worrisome thoughts for you because it is a habit you have inculcated in yourself. <clears throat> if you repeatedly nudge your brain to look at the positive side of things, it will be difficult initially, but slowly you will become good at it until you develop a positive mindset.
However, we program our brain with habits. Those habits come to us automatically. The habits don't care whether they work to our benefit or to our detriment. Compare them to the macros you create in Excel sheets and place on cells. Now the macro will do its work. So if you put wrong macros on the cells, you will get a messed up Excel sheet. Likewise, if we program our brain with harmful habits, then the, these, the brain will just generate that kind of behavior naturally for us. That is why it is said that be careful about the habits you install in yourself. Bad habits, they come easily, but they are very difficult to live with. And good habits, they require effort to create, but they are so easy to live with. How did the bad habits come? The first time the person took a smoke, he didn't realize that one day he would become addicted. He just said, okay, my friends are doing it. Let me also try. But the brain got a little kick. And few times he kept on doing it. The habit started gripping until now the cigarette comes and pinches him. Smoke me. I will not let you live in peace. That is the case of a bad habit getting created. And the same can be applied to breaking bad habits and creating beneficial ones. Why is it difficult? Because habits exert a gravitational pull upon us. Now, when a rocket has to be launched into space, you know, in Chandipur, when they launch those missiles, Agni, etc., they will tell you that the maximum fuel gets ex expended in the first few seconds of the launch. Because that rocket is fighting the force of gravity. And slowly it becomes easier, easier until it is going almost without any fuel. Likewise, if you wish to change any behavior, you need to first exert your willpower. You must be prepared. It will not be easy. But if I continue, just persist for 20 days or 30 days, that good behavior will come naturally to me. So this is the importance of installing good habits in us. And finally, before we move on to the Q&A, I would like to introduce you to the law of incremental growth. See, the internet is full of so many flashy sites that will promise you instant success. You do this two hours on the internet and take a look, these people have been earning $200 million a year. So there are so many who promise you the jackpot without the hard work behind it. Remember, that is not how life works. People who wait for the jackpot to open up in their life, they are actually the biggest crackpots. <laughs> the way to growth is one step at a time. Like, for example, when we were little children, I at least played on the merry-go-round. I'm sure most of Indian children have played on it. So the merry-go-round goes round and round and round. Now, first, when you start pushing it, it is so difficult to move because the static friction is very high. And the child is exerting to just get it moving. But slowly, the speed increases. And then it increases even more. And then it increases even more until it is going faster and faster and faster. And at that time, 
when the child discovers that the merry-go-round is fast enough, then she lifts both her legs and is standing on it and just rotating with it. And when she discovers that it has slowed down, she just puts one foot down on the ground, gives it a kick and again comes back on top of it. It has built momentum. Likewise, it is with life that initially when you wish to make a change, you will have to struggle. You will have to put in effort, but you keep on applying yourself. And then slowly, 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 the momentum builds up. And it becomes easier and easier and easier. That is why success attracts more success. Now, in the business world, they will tell you that the first one million is the most difficult to make. After you have one million, it will attract five and five will attract 20 and 20 will attract 50 and that will attract 500. But it's the first one million which is the most difficult. Likewise, it is with self transformation as well. So don't expect it, that it's going to be a unit step function from zero. We were sinners one day and the next day we become saints. Anybody who transformed themselves did it one step at a time. So with this understanding, let us apply ourselves to the infinite possibilities that await us in the reprogramming of our mind for our success, happiness, and fulfillment. Thank you all very much. Uh, I think I can invite questions because with a limited time. Thank you, Your Holiness, for the wonderful words that you've given to us, words of inspiration to live our lives in this corporate world. Now I would like to uh, unmute Rishu, who is a participant here, and um, please ask your question to Swamiji. Pranam Swamiji. Namaste. My name is Rishu Nidish Pathak Swamiji. I am, I am from UP, but currently I am living in Bhubaneswar. Uh, last month you had visited Bhubaneswar. I wanted to uh, meet you, but because of some circumstances, I could not. Last a couple of weeks back, my grandfather had uh, been into uh, Mangad to the Bhakti Dham, uh, Swamiji. And today meeting you uh, gives me immense elation and pleasure. Swamiji, my question is like, we often come across this phrase that your future is in your hands. And astrology is that Vedic ancient science which predicts your future. And according to astrology, your bhavishya is determined by your sanchit and prarabdha karma. So Swamiji, how is the future in your hands? <laughs> okay, first of all, Rishu, very happy to know that you are connected uh, with uh, our organization, your, your parents, grandparents, uh, as regards your question. You are right about Sanchit Karma and Prarabh Karma. But what is Sanchit Karma? It did not come from the outside. Sanchit means the accumulated karmas of our infinite past lifetimes. So it was by our own karmas that we created our Sanchit. And from that Sanchit, every time when God sends us into this world, he takes one fraction of it that this portion you have to reap in this lifetime that becomes the prarabdha so we were the creators of our prarabdha if you say that we have no freedom to to create our destiny then we are tied by destiny and this rule should have applied to the past life as well past life also we were tied by destiny and it should have applied to the past life as well now, if in every life we were tied by destiny, then in which life did we do the purusharth to create our destiny? 
And if we did it in any past life, then we can do it in this life as well. And if we did not do it, then where did destiny come from? So astrology is only predictive. It is not definitive. And it is sometimes very misleading because it just pushes us towards the fixed mindset. That's why I like Chanakya Pandit's Sutra. Utsahavatam shatravo pivashi bhavanti nirutsaha daivam patita. You may have had the best destiny, but if you don't put in the effort, you will lose it all. And you may have the worst destiny, but if you put in sufficient effort, you will transform it. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Swamiji. Thank you, Swamiji. Now I would request Dr. Kamalini Devi to please ask her question. Dr. Kamalini Devi, we are waiting for you. I think she's got some technical problem. Uh, yes, Swamiji. Moving on, we have a question from Amit Dipankar who asks in the chat, how to wake up early in the morning regularly? Swamiji, question. Okay. So, uh, Amit, thank you for your question. It is a very important one. It's one kind of good habit to install yourself. As the ancient saying goes, early to bed, early to rise makes a person healthy, wealthy, and wise. Those early morning hours are the golden hours. You try it out. Wake up early and study at that time. You will find your brain is like sponge in those morning hours. You can just pick up so quickly. So that is why our scriptures say, Brahme Muhuto Teshe, don't waste those two golden hours in the morning. Now, <laughs> Like I said, that if you have the habit of waking up late and you wish to break that and establish the new habit, you will find it difficult initially. So you have to overcome this. The tools you have at your disposal are willpower. Willpower when you set the alarm and the alarm rings, cring, and you wake up, now it's a struggle. Because the mind says, I was enjoying my sleep so much. You know, and the intellect says that, no, no, it's important to wake up. So you exert willpower to create the new habit. But there's another power which is even stronger than willpower. That is the why power. If you have a strong reason where people are deeply motivated, they will do anything to achieve their goals. So convince your intellect on the importance of waking up early morning and become passionate about using your life to its fullest potential. When you fill yourself with inspiration, when you, have, when you are motivated and you are convinced about the benefits of the morning. Then with willpower, you develop this new habit in yourself. Thank you, Swami. Uh, okay. The next question is from Swapnil Agarwal. Please proceed. I'm unmuting you. Pranam, Swamiji. Namaste. Um, Namaste. Uh, Namaste, Swamiji. मैंने आपकी हर वीडियो देखी है और आप मुझे काफी एनलाइटन करते हैं मेरे पूरे समय पे भी स्वामी जी और मेरा प्रश्न ये है कि चैंटिंग करना भगवान का नाम जपने से हमें कैसे फायदा होता है जाप करने से अच्छा 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 देखो स्वप्निल ग्लैड टू नो दैट यू हैव बीन वाचिंग माय वीडियोस what I explain in my videos is that you want to have good thoughts and for good thoughts, you want a pure mind. So everybody is thinking how to develop positive thinking, how to have a pure mind. 
But the path of bhakti gives a simple formula. Attach your mind to the all pure. God is all pure. You attach your mind to the all pure and the mind will become purified. So chanting is one way to take your mind to the all pure. But I teach an even more important way. And that is Roop Dhyana. See, people are chanting, Sita Ram, Sita Ram, Sita Ram. And the mind is wandering in the mind, in the world. Instead of that, you bring the image of the Lord in front of you. This is called Roop Dhyan meditation. Aapke jo bhi ist dev ho, unka swaroop apne saamne lai. Aap unke charano mein phool dale, unko gale mein mala dale. And think, I am a little part of the Lord. Think of the qualities of God and your mind will immediately start getting purified. Then as a helper, you can take the names of God, you can do any kirtan, all is fine. I hope that helps you, Swapnil. Yes, Swami Ji. Swami Ji. Next we have uh, Dr. Uh, Kamalini Devi. Uh, who will be uh, asking thank her. you, thank you so much. Namaste, Swami Ji. This is Dr. Kamalini. I have lost my connection, so here yeah. I am. Namaste. Good evening, all professors and participants, and thanks to Value Education and ITR for conducting a wonderful session by the most beloved Swami Ji. Uh, his name is only the introduction of his own for whom many youngsters like us throughout the world have transformed our life from throne to flower. Many of our questions were answered with your meticulous explanations in different lectures, Swamiji. I just want to convey my heartfelt gratitude and thanks to you for your teaching in various lecture series, which I follow every single morning. You are the best teacher and guru forever. We have learned how to be the best version of ourselves. So, Swamiji, my question is, uh, for day, how many hours we should do sadhana because I am a professor. So, uh, I am getting one hour. So, I am doing for one hour. So, is it sufficient? Yes, uh, Dr. Kamalini, thank you for your kind words. Uh, it is most satisfying to see that our youth are receiving this message and benefiting from it. And now coming to your question, <clears throat> your question is that how much time should we do sadhana every day? It is like you do exercise to keep your body healthy. So if you are a sedentary worker working in the office, you need to do some physical exercise to maintain your health. You don't do it 24 hours, you do it for about 45 minutes, half an hour, one hour. Likewise, it is with the mind. It is subject to wear and tear in the world, the worldliness. And you want to lift up your own mind. So how do you do that? For one hour, you block out the world. Now, no disturbance, no WhatsApp, no instant messaging, nothing. And in that one hour, you hear divine messages, you re read divine wisdom, contemplate on it, do dhyan, meditation, chant the names of God, sing kirtans and bhajans, the consequence will be your mind and intellect will be purified. So our scriptures say <clears throat> that you should do it for two hours a day, one tenth of your time. But in modern lifestyle, that becomes little impracticable. So what I suggest to people is that take out one hour, and then do your worldly duties after that. And then if you have more time, you spend more time as well. So Dr. Kamalini, I hope that answers your question. Yes. I have reached my time limit today. So I, from my side, would like to express my heartfelt gratitude once again for having this opportunity. I don't know if you all know that Purisa is my worldwide headquarters and I'm speaking to you today from a little village in Katak district where uh, on this campus we are establishing Jagad Guru Kripalu University and I've got satsang centers all over Orissa. And every year I travel all around the state. So if you are residing in Orissa, you are welcome to meet me anywhere, wherever I may be. And we also have many, many resources 
online that you are probably already aware about. Thank you, Tom. One thank very so special, much. yeah, sorry. One very sorry. special uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Gyan. Uh, I think he's Gyan Senapati, Gyan Ranjan. Uh, yes, Gyan Ranjan Senapati, who actually came to our campus here and uh, to invite me and who made this program possible. Go ahead. Thank you, Swamiji. It was a wonderful session that you have given to us and you have equipped us with tools to go forward in our lives. I thank you for that. I'm extremely sorry to all those people who have raised their hands but couldn't have their questions answered. I wish and I hope it's enough. Swamiji, one minute. Uh, Professor uh, Alok Satwati, you will uh, uh, say a few words. Uh, sure. See, uh, Okay. Yes, yes. Pranam Swamiji. Namaste. Uh, see, Professor Gyana has given me the most difficult task of uh, offering the thanksgiving as a part of the uh, ceremony. So I, I am wondering how to thank uh, how to thank you, a person like you, by a smaller being like me. But from the core of uh, my heart, on behalf of NIT Raurkela fraternity, fraternity of students, faculties, and uh, employees, I express uh, our heartfelt gratitude to you, Swamiji, for your thought-provoking provoking, uh, speech on thoughts, attitude, mindset, belief system, power of habits, and law of incremental growth. So th just saying just thank you is like sowing candle to sun. So it is, uh, it is, it is, uh, I'm finding really lack of words to express our deep sense of gratitude still uh, we would have uh, we are all excited delighted motivated and finally blessed in your virtual presence it would have been wonderful had you been here offline and we are looking forward for the day when you will physically come here and give your darshan to all of us and we will feel really blessed that day and till then swamiji keep blessing us and and uh, um Keep your keep keep sharing your blessings and good words and keep sharing your wisdom with all of us. Thank you, thank you all. <laughs> okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Alok, uh, for those uh, wonderful words. Definitely, I would love to physically visit your campus. And uh, for now, I offer my prayers at the feet of Lord Jagannath to bless all of your faculty, staff, and students for auspiciousness, well-being, and happiness in their lives. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Swamiji. And thank you all for joining us in this world of peace. I, I especially thank Professor Lok Satpati for sharing the vote of thanks for us and conveying what was in our hearts to Swamiji right now. May the words shared today resonate in our hearts and help us find rest and solace. Have a beautiful evening. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you.